statement here. Visiting Annapolis, I noticed several plebes on their hands and knees holding pencils and clipboards. What are they doing, I asked our tour guide. The answer was each year the upperclassmen asked the freshmen how many bricks it took to finish paving this courtyard. He said, so what's the answer? And the guide said, one. To finish it, it's just one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that wasn't as funny as some of the ones we do. <laughs> um, this, uh, this sermon is similar to the one that we did two weeks ago, which, which was helped by God. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare uh, today. We talked before about the three tribes, uh, how they were helped by God. The three tribes that stayed on the other side of the Jordan River in their struggle with the Hagarites. Do you remember that? Of course not, because I was preaching it. <laughs> I could have preached it again today. It wouldn't make a difference, because you wouldn't probably remember it anyway. But Ephesians 6.12 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So we're in one battle after another. Uh, in the, as a church and as individual people, as individual Christians, we're always in one battle. If we get over that one, another one's coming because we have a powerful enemy. Our enemy never gets tired. He never rests. He never sleeps. He never stops trying to get God's people to be ineffective in doing God's will. And... Satan has a lot of success in doing that, in pulling people away from God. Satan is the destructive. He's a destroyer. He's not a builder. He never built anything except an evil kingdom. The only thing he wants to accomplish is the destruction of God's work. He's the father of all lies. He's the father of hatred. And we are his target. Last uh, or two Sundays ago, we talked about struggles, and today we're going to talk about <clears throat> battles. Satan wants you to sin. He wants me to sin because we're in sin. We're ineffective for God, and when we're in sin, we're separated from God. That's what he wants. He wants you to hate. We have to be careful about emotional negativities because Satan wants us to be haters. Yeah. And it's easy to fall into that. People wronged us and we, you know, you gotta you gotta be careful about that. He wants you to criticize your fellow believers. I've been in churches where they're at each other's throats. Fortunately we all have a bond of love in this church. Nobody is picking on anybody else. Amen. There's nothing I see. And that's a wonderful thing. But he wants you to lie. He wants you to gossip. He wants you to be in fear. Look at this list in Galatians 5, 19 and 21. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. So idolatry is a battle. If you place something on a pedestal of your heart, on your most important place in your mind, in your heart, in your life, uh, where God belongs, then that's idolatry. God needs to be first in your life. He needs to have the first place in your life. Continuing in that verse, it says, and witchcraft <clears throat> and hatred. So like idolatry, hatred is a battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's natural response for us to want to use hatred to stir ourselves up against somebody that we're coming against or that's coming against us. But God doesn't want us to be haters. That's the way of the world. That's the way of the flesh. Amen? Amen. It's, it's a battle, a spiritual battle. 
So that's the natural response. But we are to rise above the natural responses because we're no longer the natural man. We have a rejuvenated spirit in us, and we are to rise above hatred and those other kinds of things. Much of what's going on in the country and in the world is because of hatred. I don't have to expand on that. You know it's true. Hatred. And then in Matthew 24, 10 to 13, it says, At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. It's talking about people who once were bonded in the faith. Many will betray the faith and hate each other at that time. And many false prophets, verse 11, will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's what you got to do. you got to stand firm to the end. Hatred is easy. Hatred is ungodly. Overcoming hatred is a battle, is a spiritual battle to overcome that. And to continuing, another one is discord. Discord is a noun. Um, it's a lack of agreement among persons, groups, or things, synonyms, uh, or conflict, tension, or strife resulting from a lack of agreement. That's discord, dissension. You don't have to look very far to find discord. <laughs> Just watch the news. Discord. The Bible says that so in discord among the brethren is one of the things that's listed that God hates. That means within a church, people go around and say, I don't think the pastor should be doing this. I don't think brother so-and-so should be doing that. And they're sowing discord. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's a terrible thing. It causes bitterness and it causes anger. Larger churches have discord. Fortune. We don't have that here. But I've experienced it almost every church that I've that I've been in. Discord is something where they try to pull other people away from the leadership of the church. That's how churches split. We see that commonly. And continuing with another one, it says jealousy. Jealousy is a monster. Yes. People get murdered because of jealousy. It's a monster. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery because they were jealous of his favoritism with his father that made him that fancy coat. Have you ever seen jealousy? You can see the results of it. You can't actually see jealousy itself, but you can see it happening. You can see the results. The Pharisees were jealous of Jesus. Because he won the affection of the people. They had authority over the people. They held sway over the people, but they didn't have, they didn't have affection of the people. And he was seen as a threat to their authority. So they determined to kill him. They plotted, let's get rid of him. Continuing, another one that says, fits of rage. Did you see that road rage on the news a couple weeks ago? The driver couldn't stand to have anyone in front of him. And he was weaving back and forth. All of a sudden he lost control and he crashed and he totaled the car. And you see that one? It was a couple weeks ago. And he couldn't stand to have anybody in front of him. It was a rage, a fit of rage. He was trying to intimidate the car in front of him to get out of his way by getting on the guy's bumper. And he wouldn't move, so he went over this way. And he was weaving back and forth and he lost control. Unfortunately, he wasn't hurt, but the car was totally demolished. Fits of rage. His car flipped over a couple of times. It's amazing he wasn't killed. Continuing in this list of things, the next one is selfish ambition. It says in James 3, 14 and 16, it says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. 
Then it says in verse 15, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So it's describing where the source is of selfish ambition. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Ambition combined with selfishness is destructive. It's okay to have ambition. You need to have goals. I have ambition to lead, lead someone to the Lord. We have ambition to grow this church. Ambition is, is sometimes, if, if it's all about me or you, then it's referred to as earthly and unspiritual and demonic. That's what it's referred to. So continuing then in the next of these lists here, is dissensions and factions. Dissensions and factions go hand in hand. Dissension and factions. Somebody doesn't agree, they gather other people around them who also don't agree, and that becomes a faction. The dissension is a disagreement, and then the faction is people gathering around. And that's where you see churches split. That's harmful to the church. And other organizations as well. Bad feelings instead of Love. Love has to prevail. Especially in the church. Love has to prevail. Amen. And then in verse 21, it continues, And envy, drunkenness, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So some of these things are obvious, but some are so subtle that you may not be even able to recognize that you're doing it. Actually, we should back up and look at verse 10 through 20 in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. There's no power in existence that can outdo God's power. My power isn't up to the task. I don't have any power. It's not up to the task. Fortunately, his power is available to us in our battles. But there are things that we are instructed to do. So we don't have the power. His power is available, but there are things that we are instructed to do. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The armor of God, and only that, but the, and not only that, but the full, the full armor of God. All that is for us. We are to use it all. We are to use the full armor of God. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's where, that's where our battle comes from. It's not just against a road rage person or against somebody that hates you. Maybe. That is all coming from these, <coughs> these evil forces. And when it says heavenly realms, that doesn't mean heaven where God's throne is. There's three heavens referred to in the Bible. One of them is the atmosphere around us. The next one is space, and the next one after that is the third heaven that Paul referred to that he was caught up in, and that is where God's throne is. This right here is the, is the atmosphere. So you can't shoot them. <laughs> I wish you could shoot them. You can't stick them with a sword. You can't punch them out. You can't stomp them. You can't tie them up. It might cause a surprise to you, but you can't bind them. We've kind of cost us thinking we can bind Satan. We keep saying that in our prayers. But if that were true, Satan would be bound, and he's not. He's loose. He's roaming around looking for somebody to desire. He will be bound by God and thrown into a pit for a thousand years. But I can't bind him. If I could bind him, I mean, he would be bound already. But you can bind what the demons are doing. 
You can bind the effect you're having on someone. Satan won't be bound until God binds him and locks him up in the pit. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And that refers to the first heaven, not God's throne. The first heaven is the atmosphere. Demons are said to attack us from the air. That's where they attack us from. And continuing in verse 13, therefore put on the, full, on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may able to be able to, with, to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand your ground, it says, with the armor on. You don't run away. You don't hide. You don't retreat. You don't have to. With the armor of God on you, you're as prepared as you can be to engage in spiritual warfare. So here's the answer. Here's the armor. Stand firm then. We must stand in opposition to the craft and wiles of Satan and his many associates which happen to be demons. And if you don't know that, they're all over the place. They're everywhere. A third of, a third of the angels were cast to the earth along with Satan. I don't know how many were there, but they're all over the place, working their mischief all over, and getting people to hate each other, etc. So continuing then in verse 14, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, verse 16, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which with you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Amen. and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. There you have it. The belt of truth. This was the belt on a soldier's tunic. There was a belt. The sword hung from the belt, and it gave him freedom of movement. The belt was a foundation of the soldier's armor, holding his sword in his breastplate. The belt was incredibly important. So remember that Satan is the father of lies. This is the this is the um, breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. He disguises himself and manipulates your perspective. Think about that for a minute. Your perspective in life. He manipulates that. You have to rise above that. He wants to divide your home. He wants to destroy you and your family. By the way, Marxism doesn't want the nuclear family. They want the state to raise the children. The socialists and the Marxists, they don't want people to raise their own kids. And BLM espouses that point of view right in their own writing. He constantly reminds you of your past. And your bad choices that you've made. He keeps throwing those up in your face. He's the father of lies. He disguises himself and manipulates your perspective. But he cannot stand against the truth. We're talking about the belt of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He cannot stand against the truth, which is Jesus. And the breastplate of righteousness refers to the righteousness purchased for us by Jesus at the cross. That salvation of breastplate is issued to each repentant sinner. It is specially designed by God to protect our heart and soul from evil and deception. We are instructed to put on this armor, which implies that we do not automatically wear it all the time. He says, put it 
on. Putting on the armor of God requires a decision on our part. To put on the breastplate of righteousness, we must first have the belt of truth firmly in place. And three was fitted with readiness. A soldier's battle shoes were studded with nails or spikes, a Roman soldier. They were like cleats to help him keep his balance in the combat. He knew that if he lost his footing and went down, it wouldn't matter how great the rest of his armor was, the enemy had him. In addition to standing our ground, we are, uh, the shoes are also for, for moving, for moving. God expects us to go on the offensive and take the gospel of peace to others, which is, a, which is exactly uh, what our kids' corner was about this morning. Spreading that love to other people. That's a battle. It's not easy because we have an, we have an, an, a, an enemy. Always be prepared. That's the readiness to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Sharing our faith is one of the best ways to maintain our sure footing in the back. Number four, shield of faith. The shield protected the Roman soldier from all sorts of attacks. The sword and spear attacks he could see. The rock and arrow attacks from above. And the flaming darts attacks that come in too quickly to see. And sometimes they would link together and make a, like a line of, of shields. And the row and back woman would put their shields up. And it would be kind of a barrier to keep flaming darts that were thrown at them. And that was with the, in the Roman battles, which this takes its uh, source from. The shield was above all overall protecting the soldier as well as the soldiers on either side. With God as our shield, what do we have to fear? Nothing. Amen. Nothing. There's nothing that is large enough, powerful enough, or strong enough to get past God when he has set himself to protect us from harm. Therefore, as Christians, we have nothing to fear from Satan <coughs> or wicked men or future events. God is on our side. To get through to the... Uh, other pieces of armor, the enemy has to get past God first, and he's not going to be able to do that. No flaming arrows or fiery darts can get through our faith. And then the helmet of salvation. The helmet was vital for survival, protecting the brain, the command station for the rest of the body. If the head was, bottled, was badly damaged, the rest of the armor would be of little use. See, all these parts of armor work together. The assurance of salvation is our impenetrable defense against anything the enemy throws at us. We know that uh, we know that we know that we know that we are saved by the grace of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit, and there is no doubt. We must learn to keep our helmets buckled so that the fiery missiles do not lodge in our thoughts and set us on fire. He tries. Through this helmet of salvation, we can destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That was in 2 Corinthians 10.5. And then the sword of the spirit. And this, is, this is say the saying of God applied to a specific situation. This is the great weapon placed in the hands of the believer. Perhaps all of us have had some experience with this, the sword of the spirit. We have all read passages of, of uh, passages of scripture when the words suddenly seem to come alive. You know what I mean? You just read your daily readings of, wow, I never saw that before. That's what I needed for today. That's what I needed for my problem. That's what I needed right there for what's happening. 
the Spirit quickens that word to us. Sometimes we grow eyes that, you know, that follow us around everywhere we go. Perhaps we have experienced this in a moment of temptation or doubt when we need, when we were assailed by what Paul calls were the flaming arrows of the evil one. But it's been answered immediately by a passage of scripture that has flashed to mind something we had not been thinking of at all, but which supplied the needed answer. Have you ever been there? Yes. Have you ever been there? Sure. It's not going to happen if you're not in the Bible, but that is what that is why it is called the sword of the spirit. Because it not only originated by him, by God as the author of the work, but it also recalled, it's also recalled to mind by the spirit and made powerful by him in our lives. It's his answer to the attack of the devil who comes to discourage us, defeat us, lure us aside, deceive us, mislead us in some way. Number seven is pray in the Spirit. Prayer must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is, enables us to pray more adequately. Um, this doesn't mean to pray in one's heart, but to pray under the influence of the Spirit. Praying in tongues is an example of praying in the Spirit. But you can pray under the influence of the Spirit, not of your own words, but of the Spirit, and that is praying in the Spirit. We need His assistance in our prayer. Whether it's praying in tongues or with the understanding, it must be done in the power and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Pray on all occasions, it says. So pray in happiness, pray in sorrow, Pray thankful prayer when things are going well. Pray for God to move when things are not going so well. We lay our request before him in humility and in respect. He's God. We can't demand anything of God. And then it says all kinds of prayers. Silent prayers. Vocal prayers. Solo prayers. Prayers with other believers. Prayers of gratitude, prayers about ambitions, prayers of repentance, prayers about our weaknesses. Pray, pray that God will be will bring us through to victory, and that be His victory. And then Paul asked in verse 19, he said, "Also pray for me that whenever I speak, words may may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel." for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I am bold enough to ask as your pastor to you, for you to pray for me. The leader is a special target of the enemy and I covet your prayers. I covet that you would pray for me daily. I pray for all of you specifically by name at least twice a day. At least twice. Pray for me at least once, please. <laughs> Would you do that? Um, it helps. So we live on the face of it in a heathen nation. If not for the church, we would be standing alone against a sea of evil. We exist in the devil's territory. Satan wants us to sin because sin separates us from our God. And renders us ineffective in carrying the light of the gospel in the Satan's dark world. In our battles, you will be cast down, the Bible says, but not destroyed. You can expect to have setbacks. You can expect that. But we can also expect God to help us, especially in our infirmities. And uh, the older you get, the more infirmities uh, come your way. <laughs> the more infirmities happen. In our weakness, his strength enables us to be victorious. But it's not our victory, it's his victory. Amen? Yes, amen. It, says, it says, I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who strengthens me. 
None of my strengths, I don't have any. But through Christ who strengthens me, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Satan has his weapons. In our warfare, we will come against, he will come against us with the best that he has. You know, when the Israelites were up against the Red Sea, and they looked up, and Pharaoh's army was, was there with 600 of his best chariots, and then it says, and all the rest of his chariots. He came against them with everything he had, and God brought a deliverance in support of the Red Sea. But Satan has his weapons. He knows what your weakness is. But it's, and as soon as you get built up against that one, he finds another one. He's always testing and probing to find out where there might be weakness in you. In our, warf in our warfare, he will come against us with the best that he has, just like the Pharaoh did. But nothing that he has can overcome the spiritual weapons that God gives us. He cannot overcome that. We win. Read the end of the book. <laughs> we win. We are victorious, but it's God's victory. We're just along for the ride. So that's just a little bit about spiritual warfare. And it, you know, you don't choose to be in spiritual warfare. If, if you don't have a victory in it then, it, then it has a victory against you. So you need to be aware of of the devil's wiles. He wants to destroy the work of God in you. He wants to destroy you. He's a father of lies, and he's the source of hatred. And we see hatred going on all over the place. It's all around us. It's on the news. And sometimes you can see it in people's eyes. If you have the Holy Spirit here, and you can kind of see hatred on people's faces. You can. You really can. But we win. But there is a struggle. We're not going to just run away and be out of the struggle because it'll come after us. So spiritual warfare is a battle. It's one battle after another. And it's what we have to go through. But, but, but God gives us the victory. Amen? Amen. Can you stand? By the way, next week after church, we have a board meeting that we have to have uh, in advance of our annual business meeting, which would be one or two weeks after that. Uh, so next week we'll have a church board meeting. Dear Lord, today we join our hearts together with gratitude that you are with us in our battles and help us, Lord, to realize that our battles are your battles and, uh, and we don't have to fight any of them alone. We have the Word, we have the Holy Spirit, we have salvation, we have the cross, we have the message, and we know that our enemy will try to stop us from sharing that message every chance he gets. We know there's evil in the world, and it's trying to overcome the gospel and the good of the world. We know that, Lord. And we also know that we can't fight these battles without your help, but we also know that your help is available, and we thank you for that, Lord. We're eternally grateful for that, Lord. Lord, as uh, we all go our own way today, Lord, we just ask that you bless each person and uh, stay in our thoughts today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.